Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felder. Okay, it's good to see everybody in. My goodness, we've got the room just about full, and we've got folks here from Orlando, Florida, and from Chicago, San Francisco, and uh, all the points in between, I guess. But anyway, we're glad you're here this afternoon, and for those of you joining us on television, of course, we're just an informal Bible study, and uh, I keep emphasizing, even to our phone callers, I am not associated with any one group. I'm not going to let anyone start putting peer pressure on me, and I told someone yesterday, I said, I only report to one person, and that's the Lord himself. And I accept that responsibility, and I know that whenever we open the scripture, it is a tremendous responsibility, and uh, I never make light of that whatsoever. So again, for those of you out on television, we just want to thank you for your prayers, for your letters, my, and, and you've all learned to keep them short, haven't they, honey? They, they all realize that, that we like them short, and uh, they do. They, they keep them short so that we can still read every one. And uh, when we say that we read every letter, we're not kidding. It's starting to take a little more time, but we still do. And uh, for that reason, we do appreciate the shortness. But uh, my, how many times people will write to tell us that now for the first time in their life, they know that they die, they go to heaven. And uh, that, of course, is the main reason we're here. And then, of course, the second biggest part is that they're learning to study the Word on their own. Not what Les Feldick says, but what does the book say? And uh, that's our primary concern. All right, we're in 1 John chapter 4, and for those of you out on television, we are now in the middle four programs of book number 57. And uh, next month's taping, we'll finish that one. And then a month or so after that, it'll be available to be sent out through the mail. So if you're interested in any of the content of the program today, just tell the girls that we're in book number 57. All right, 1 John chapter 4, we finished last taping in, number, in verse 10. And now verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Now, the first thing that verse should remind you that John is writing this little epistle, and what famous verse in his gospel says almost the same thing? Well, John 3.16, For God so loved the world. Of course he did. Of course he did. And that's the very crux of the matter when uh, we study the, the crucifixion and so forth. It was driven by his love for lost mankind. All right, so I don't think I have to comment much on that. But now verse 12, I imagine, has hit people between the eyes, and they can't figure this one out. And what does it say? No man hath seen God at any time. Now, is that what the Bible always says? No, let me show you a verse. Now, this is Bible study. This is what I love to do. Go all the way back to Genesis all the way back to Genesis. And uh, that would have to be in about 32. Genesis chapter 32. And Jacob is coming back from his years with his uncle Laban. And he's just entered back into the land of Canaan, and uh, he's spent the night wrestling with a stranger. And uh, you know the story. And the stranger asked him, what is thy name? Verse 27. Genesis 32, verse 27. And the one who wrestled with him all night said, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and has prevailed. Now verse 29. And Jacob asked him, that is this stranger now that's been wrestling with him all night long. And so Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, what is thy name? And the stranger said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he, the stranger, blessed him. 
Now verse 30. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. And it's capitalized. For I have seen who? God. See? For I have seen God face to face. And my life is preserved. Well, now, does the scripture contradict? Never. Sounds like it, doesn't it? John says, no man has seen God at any time. Jacob says, I've seen him face to face. Well, now you've got to stop and think of all the times in Scripture that mankind did see God face to face. For example, do you think Adam and Eve walked with an invisible ghost in the garden? Is that what you think? Of course not. They walked with a human form. Now then, jump on up past even Jacob's experience. I'm going to bring you up to Exodus. And we're up with Moses. Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. And some of these things confuse people simply because they will not check out the Scripture. Because the answers are here. All right, Exodus chapter 3. Moses at the burning bush. And I've even skipped over Genesis 18 where Abraham, you remember, killed the fatted calf? Remember the three strangers that came down the path and he ran and killed the fatted calf and the three sat down and they ate? Two of them were angels, went on down to Sodom and the third one stayed behind and conversed with Abraham? Who was it? It was God. All right, now here we got the same person of the Godhead. Now I let the thing out of the bag, didn't I? It's a certain person of the Godhead, see? All right, now in Exodus chapter 3, Moses sees the burning bush, verse 3. And so he says, I will turn now aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. Now watch the language in your Bible. And when the who? Lord. Capitalized. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital E. And the Lord in the Old Testament economy is Jehovah. And Jehovah is in the Old Testament now who? Christ. See? The Son. All right. So now then, when the Lord saw, that is Jehovah, God the Son, when he saw that Moses turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. Now, I want you to watch the back and forth terms of deity in this chapter, because it, it is such a mind-boggling thing. We've already got him called God and Lord, out of the burning bush. All right, so then he speaks to Moses, and he says, Here am I. Verse 5, he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, that is, out of the burning bush, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Are you convinced now he's God? Well, you better be. This burning bush voice is God. All right, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon who? God. Now, I don't think he just saw a flame. I think he saw a person in that burning bush. He looked upon God. See? All right, then uh, he hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Not upon the fire, upon God. Now, verse 7. This same person called God in verse 6 is now the Lord in verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, and so on and so forth. Now, I don't have to come through, you know, all the, all the account. All I'm showing you are the use of terms of deity. All right, so now you come all the way down to verse 11, and it's still the same language Moses says to God. The very God that John says no man has ever seen. And I think there's even another scripture where it puts it even more strongly, that no man hath ever seen God and lived. Well, whatever. 
Here we have Moses looking straight into the face of God. All right, and he says unto God, verse 11, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Verse 12, and he said, Certainly, that is, God from the burning bush says, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mo uh, mountain. Now verse 13, And Moses said unto who? God. Now that's emphasis enough, isn't it? Repetition, whatever you need. Moses says unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me, and they shall say, What is his name? Now that's an important facet all through Scripture. And we're going to be seeing it even now in the verses to come in 1 John. The name. My, that meant everything. What's his name? Who is he? And God said to Moses, now in verse 14, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. That's the name of our God. He's the great I am. But he's also called Lord. He's also now before we go back up to the New Testament, I want you to back up a moment to Genesis. Chapter 1 and 2. And again, we're just going to skim, just to show you the terminology. <clears throat> Genesis, chapter 1. All the way through here, the term is God. God, see? All right, let's go all the way back to verse 1. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. But now you see, in the original Hebrew, the term here for God is what? Elohim. Elohim. And Elohim is a plural Hebrew word. Not singular, it's plural. In fact, whenever you're reading your Old Testament and it speaks of pagan gods, plural, what do you suppose the word is? Well, it's Elohim, but in small letters. E-L-O-H-I-M is translated gods, plural, small g. But with a capitalization, Elohim is God in a plurality. Now keep that up there in your computer for a little bit. Elohim of Genesis 1-1 is a plurality God, a person in three Persons, a God in three persons. All right, but now as you come through Genesis chapter 1, it's all the way through God. 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 Okay? Now you jump into chapter 2, and you come down to verse 4, and now for the first time you've got a change in that term. It's not just God, it's what? Lord God. Now what are we talking about? We're talking about the I am God. We're talking about the Jehovah God. See? Now who in the world is the I am God? Who is the Jehovah God? Who is capital L-O-R-D of the Old Testament? Now jump up to John's Gospel. I hope I'm still holding this all together. John's Gospel, chapter 8. Jesus and his earthly ministry. And he's being confronted by the Pharisees. They're accusing him of everything but the truth. They're accusing him of being a demon, primarily. Verse 51. John's Gospel, chapter 8, verse 51. Now, we're going to take this very slowly, if I can. I, I have a hard time going slow, but I'm going to try I want you to see now how that all of this fits without contradiction. There's no contradiction, even though it sounds like it. All right, now then, in verse 51, Jesus in his earthly ministry is speaking, and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know you have a demon. Abraham is dead. 
the prophets, they're dead. And thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who's dead? Are you greater than the prophets who are dead? Who makest thou thyself? Now Jesus answers, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say he's your God. Verse 55, Yet you have not known him, but I do. I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I should be a liar like you. But I know him, and I keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Now again, I think you can go right back to one I alluded to. Back in Genesis 18, where the three men came down the path, and Abraham ran with hospitality and killed the fatted calf and served up a beef supper. Two of them were angels, went on to Sodom, but one was the Lord. And so he conversed with him. You know the conversation. If there's 50 in Sodom, will you spare it? Yes, if there's 50. If there's 40, 30, 20, you know the conversation. And then it says the Lord went up from him. All right, now I'm sure that this is one of the times that Jesus is referring to. Yes, Abraham knew who I am. Abraham conversed with me. Now read on. Verse 57, Then said the Jews unto him, You're not yet 50 years old. Abraham's 2,000 years ago. And you say you have seen Abraham? Now look at Jesus' answer, and this is the crux of the whole matter. And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, what? I am. He's the eternal I am. Abraham, 2,000 years back, was just nothing but an eyelash flick, so far as Christ was concerned. All right, so what have we got in all this? I guess the best way is to put it on the board like we did years ago, I think, in some of our earlier programs. And that is, uh, I like to use a circle, if I may. And this is the Godhead. God the Father. God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All right, now when, let's use Scripture. Let's use Scripture. Go back with me to Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Once in a while I even have to repeat them to see where I'm at. Acts chapter 2. Verse 22. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Now I imagine some of you thinking, well, what's this got to do with all this? Well, hopefully we can put it all together. Verse 22, he says, Ye men of Israel. Now this is Peter on the day of Pentecost. And Peter says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. That's his name. Don't forget that. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Who did it? God did. See that? God did. But it was Jesus of Nazareth who performed it, right? All right. So he said, which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Now look at verse 23. Him, this Jesus of Nazareth, being delivered, that is, up for crucifixion, by the determinant consul and for knowledge of God, you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. All right, now while you're in Acts anyway, go on ahead a little bit to Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 2. And again, I have to read verse 8 in order to understand fully verse 9. 
Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. I want to wait till you all find it. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, where Paul gives the warning, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That's the word we have to get. Christ. Next verse. For in him, who? Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the what? Godhead. Bodily. Now what's the Godhead? Well, I'm a circle here on the board. Here's the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's God. Back in Genesis 1.1, that's Elohim. I don't know if the camera can pick that up good enough for people out on TV to see or not, but anyhow, Elohim. That's the composite of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, now as soon as, according to Acts, the Godhead consulted and agreed that they would bring about creation. Now, you've got to remember that before something was created, there was what? Nothing. Just God. And then when the Creator began, of course, that puts things in motion. All right, so when the Godhead agreed that they would bring about creation, in that agreement to create and set everything in motion was already the plan of redemption, the cross. That's what Peter is saying. That according to the foreknowledge of God, he went to the cross. God wasn't caught by surprise. It was all predetermined, see? All right, so what we have to understand then is that when the triune Godhead decided to set things in motion, it was delegated to the Son. And he then became the one who actually called in creation. He became the creator, even though the whole God has been involved. The Holy Spirit was there. The Father's involved. But the Son is the one who steps out of that invisible Godhead and becomes visible. And that's why I can show you all these verses where the Lord appeared to these various people. And then, of course, miracle of miracles, he appeared at Bethlehem, born of the Virgin Mary. All the same person of the Godhead, see? And so now, you see, let me take your verse back where uh, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. And we're talking about this same person of the Godhead. 1 Corinthians 15. The ones I'm always using as the gospel. And we'll just look at all of them. we got time enough. I'm getting so close to the end of the New Testament anyway, I might as well slow down a little or <laughs> well, I won't know where to go next. But whatever. We're, we're going to keep uh, producing. People are getting a little worried. What am I going to do now when we get past Jude and Revelation? Well, we hope the Lord comes before them. But if not, well, we're going to find some place. We're going to stay on the air. Don't worry. All right, let's start at verse 15, chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which, that is, this gospel, you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, lest you have believed in vain. Now here comes the gospel for today. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he arose again the third day according to the Scriptures. All right, now here's the part I wanted you to see connecting with what we've been looking at. And then he was seen of Cephas, that is, after the resurrection. Then of the twelve, in other words, the whole group of the disciples, not counting Judas. After that, after he appeared to the twelve, after that, he was seen above over 500 brethren 
at once, of whom the greater part remain to this present. In other words, Paul is writing this probably around A.D. 58, 59, which means that most of those people who witnessed the resurrection were now getting up in years, but they were still living. It was still in their lifetime. And so Paul says, most of these people who saw his resurrected body, most of them were still living, but some, of course, have died. Then verse 7, after that, he was seen of James, the one who writes the little letter of James at the back of our New Testament. Then of all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen of me, Paul, as one born out of the due time. All right, so what am I trying to show? That you see, Corinthians, go on ahead to Colossians. Go ahead to Colossians, chapter 1. Colossians, chapter 1. We've got to do this quickly. Now, all of a sudden, the time's gone. You know that? Colossians, chapter 1. Dropping down to verse 15, where the pronoun who, of course, is modified by the word son up in verse 13. So we're speaking of the son again. Christ, Jesus of Nazareth. Verse 15. Who is the image of something that you can see and touch. He is the image of the, what God? Invisible. See? He is the image of this invisible Godhead, Elohim, of which John was speaking back here in verse 11, that no man has seen. No man has ever seen the Godhead. Nobody. But when God the Son steps out of that Godhead, then now read on here in the closing seconds of this program. He is the image of the invisible God. Now verse 16, for by Him, by Christ, by God the Son, were all things created in heaven, that are in earth, visible, so on and so forth. And then bringing it on down to verse 18, and so then He becomes the head of the body, which is the church today. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Why? Verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him, in God the Son, should all things dwell. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.